Good morning. Do you know what a mixed metaphor is? So if someone says something like, I'm going to iron out all the bottlenecks, yeah? That's a mixed metaphor. Uh, I drove past a good one on my way to work this morning, it was on a newspaper headline, and it said, sacked Prasa bus nail. Um, so, I can't promise any gems like that, but I'm going to try and mix up some metaphors today while we talk about emergent design. Is the volume okay? Am I talking too loudly, too softly? We're good. Awesome. Alright, so emergent design. It's not enough for code to work. This is the thing that we're here to talk about today. Uncle Bob said that, and I think it's true. Um, so, why would, why would he say that? Um, if, uh, if being functional isn't the only thing that code is for, um, what else is it, is it meant to do? And so to illustrate this point, I want to take you through a simple example. So I'm a modern developer, this is actually happen in my real job, but I, I work remotely, and I talk to my product owner via Slack. So we're having a conversation, and my product owner says, uh, how's work going on the first few features for an awesome product? And I say, great, I'm all done. Yeah, that's never happened before. Um, and uh, the product owner says, wow, that was fast. Awesome. Let's put it in production and go. Um, then we have another conversation uh, a couple of weeks later. The product owner says, uh, oh, we've had a great response to our first release. Uh, can you please add a feature for me? I'll, I'll email you the details. And I say, sure. Well, let me have a look. The product owner says, thanks. How long is that going to take? And I say, um, right? <laughs> I don't know. What, what's happened here? What's, what's going on? Sound familiar to anyone? Yeah, people are nodding. I need an answer because I've got a book I can give you. Yes, it sounds familiar. Good, thank you. If you want to win another one or two or three of those, uh, visit the forward stand around the corner. Alright. So the first question that I want us to answer today is why should we care about design? So the reason in that previous example why suddenly it was harder to do work was because we hadn't thought about how we were doing the work the first time. Right? We went really fast, we did things quick and messy, and when it got to changing things to work differently, it wasn't so easy anymore. Um, so we want to talk about why we might want to do design. All right. So I'm no electrician, so please do not put your lives on the line based on anything that I tell you today. Um, but when you cut open, open, when you cut open a wire, um, there are actually three little wires living inside it. There's a, in this case, a yellow and greenish one. And there's a brown one, and there's a blue one. Um, and this is really important to electricians because it helps them know what to expect. So when you cut this thing open, you've got the three different colors, and they each mean something. So the blue one means that it's a, a neutral wire, and the brown one means that it's a live wire, um, and the greenish one means that it's an earth wire, and they all go in different holes. And so it's important to know that when you open this thing up. And so we've, we've kind of added some structure to something that might not have been that easy to understand in order to make it a bit easier for us to understand. And why this is important is because at some point, you're going to do something a little bit more complicated. So this is an example. This is a DB board you might find in your house. And you can see that there are lots of different wires here, and they all have different colors, and they all have different holes that they go into. And when an electrician opens up that DB board, they can kind of poke around and see, okay, well, this one goes in here, and that one goes over there. And when they want to make some sort of change to the circuitry or replace some portion of this DB board, they can just do it because they kind of know what to expect, and they kind of know the lay of the land. Um, and so, imagine the same DB board looking very differently, right? Imagine if there were no different colors, and imagine if the wires were kind of all over the place, they were like little bunches and they were all kind of knotted together. If you open that up, you might be a little afraid as an electrician, right? You might not want to shock yourself. Um, and so, there's some design at, at play. Uh, there's some process of making sense out of what's currently there, so that the next time that I come and I have to do something, I you know, I'm not going to shock myself. And no system is perfect. So this is from Wikipedia. It's a list of all the different wire colors in different countries. So if you have a look at um, South Africa, which is down at the bottom here, you can see that black is a neutral wire. So I don't think it was what I was taught in primary school, which might not be good. Um, and then you can see here that blue is uh, one of the live wires. Uh, and then when we have a look at Brazil, which is third from the top there, you can see that blue is a neutral wire, and there is no black wire. 
And so if you're an electrician that happens to do work in both Brazil and South Africa, you're going to need to remember that small little difference, right? It might actually be quite important for your customer. You might blow all their circuitry if you kind of forget this difference. Um, so there are some exceptions here in the world of electricians, but um, hopefully not too many, right? Hopefully enough that you can kind of keep them in your head so that you don't make some sort of terrible mistake. And it's quite similar when you're designing software. You know, there are things that are slightly different here and there. Um, but it's important overall to keep things making some sort of sense. Um, so electricians have a fairly dangerous job, right? So your DB board in your house is maybe not the best example, but there are people who wire power plants and did the wiring for this building over here, right? And it's like, you know, it's death-defying work if you don't do it properly. So um, why am I talking about this when I'm talking about software? Is it as important for software? Does anyone here drive a Jeep? <laughs> yeah? You drive a Jeep? Has that happened to you yet? Okay, so for those of you who don't know what this is about, Jeep decided to be very clever about the way that their cars work. In fact, most cars nowadays have little computers on them, and someone wrote some code on those computers, and someone hacked the Jeep and drove the guy into a ditch. That's not great, yeah? So as we become more and more in this world of the Internet of Things, code is everywhere, and code is important, right? The last time you went to the hospital, someone coded some software that recorded your test results. And someone coded some software that, you know, did that beep, beep, beep thing that you see on Grey's Anatomy. <laughs> that's, that's software. And, um, you know, someone's coding what happens in a car. And so it becomes more and more important that you're writing good quality code. Because it actually might mean the difference between life and death for someone. Um, and so that might not be the case on your insurance you know, claim system, but it's still important to people, and it's important to have, have that quality right. And why am I talking about quality when I'm meant to be talking about design? Well, I think the two are very, very closely linked, and we'll talk about that a bit more in a second. All right, so there is also software in aircraft, right? So this is a cockpit of some big scary plane, a lot of buttons, lots of software busy running over there. So what Boeing used to do is when their first flights, you know those test flights that they do? You know, like you build the airplane, hope everything's okay, and then off you go, right? The developers were on that flight. Because <laughs> yeah? so they encoded the software that runs the autopilot. Yeah? So think to yourself about some code that you wrote last week or the week before. Uh, would you be on that flight? Yeah? Would you be phoning your uh, financial advisor beforehand saying, get my affairs in order. <laughs> yeah? So the point I'm trying to drive home is that software is everywhere, and in the next couple of years, software is going to be in more and more places. Um, you know, and so it's going to be really important that we're doing a good job of writing software, uh, because it's actually going to matter to people's lives. All right, so three reasons why we want to care about good design. One is that something is well designed is easy to learn. Yeah? I was in primary school when I learned about the three different colored wires. Yeah? So clearly that's a good, simple way, barring all the exceptions, of learning how something works. Yeah? And so if something is well designed, if a code base is well designed, someone sits in front of that for the first time, it's not going to take them too long to figure out how to do something. Right? Because there are some sort of established ways of how these things are meant to work. You know, there are the blue things and the red things and the green things. Another thing that comes out of that is that there are fewer bugs. Right? So picture the DB board that we opened up that had wires all over the place, right? It's like a tangled mess. If that's your code, you're going to write bugs. Okay? You're not going to be able to untangle everything and put everything back where it's meant to go exactly. And so if you have well-designed code, like that DB board that was nice and clean to work with, you're going to make fewer mistakes. And the last thing here is that it's faster to change because it's easy to learn and you're not going to be too scared. You're going to be able to make the changes that you want to make fairly quickly. Yeah? So last year at Agile Africa, I was here, I was talking about kind of what makes an organization agile. And one of the things that I spoke about is I spoke about the fact that your code should be an asset to you. It needs to be able to move quickly. Because Rebecca was speaking about how kind of the whole point of Agile is that you want to be able to change quickly. And if your code isn't able to change quickly, you know, no matter how quickly your business analyst can tear up and rewrite user stories, you're not going to be able to change quickly if your code can't do it with you. And one of the ways that we keep our code nimble is by designing it well. All right, so why design tick? Why do we care about emergent design? And here is the, the often lauded and anticipated cake. Right? So looks pretty damn good. Yeah, you're excited? Okay, good. All right, so how do we bake a cake? No, only coders here, no, no bakers. 
<laughs> okay. So I, I, uh, I have never baked a cake, but I have watched people bake cakes. And what happens is that you have a piece of paper, it's called the recipe, yeah? You can even get it on the internet. Someone's coded a recipe up for you. And you can go through it. It's got ingredients, and then it's got a method, right? So it's like, you need to buy 300 grams of this, and 20 grams of that, and five teaspoons of this, um, and 23 cubic ounces of something else, and then you have to find one of those conversion things and figure out what the right thing is to do. And then it's got a method, right? So you put 300 grams of this and that, and you mix it. All right, and it goes in the oven at a certain temperature for a certain amount of time, and you open it up, and voila! A cake. <laughs> yeah? And the next time you make the cake, you follow the same ingredients, and you do the same method, you put it in the oven, you take it off the bread, up, up, a cake! And it looks the same. Yeah? So there's something in there, which is that before you start baking a cake, you know what needs to go in, right? And you know what's going to happen. It's simple, right? Another thing that happens when you bake cake is if you make a mistake, right? If you put the wrong amount of flour in or you, I don't know, don't put enough sugar in or whatever, you take it out. Can you fix it? No. <laughs> bake a new cake. Or go down to Woolies and buy one. Yeah? Like there's no <laughs> redoing it quickly. You might be able to patch up some holes with icing, but that's pretty much as far as you're going to go. And so Martin Fowler says that this is not what software is like process of baking a cake, right? And for a long time we thought that this is what software is like, right? And we called it upfront design, right? And someone decided these are the things that we need to do to build our software, right? And we wrote it all down and we said it'd be cool, there's gonna be this class that's gonna to talk to that class and this class is gonna be called that. Right? And we had a really good idea before we started um, what this thing was gonna look like. Um, but that's that's not really what software is like. So Martin says that writing software it's more like taking a shower. Okay. Right, who here has taken a shower? <laughs> yes. Keep your hand up if you're taking a shower today. No, no, you don't. <laughs> you don't have to do that. Um, I don't know things about you that I didn't need to know. Okay. So how do you take a shower, right? You're going to walk up to the shower and you're going to open up the hot tap. And you're going to wave. And you're going right? to stick your hand in and it's going to be hot, hot enough. And you stick your hand in again, and it's going to be hot. It's going to be too hot. Oh, bloody hell. Okay. Open up the cold tap. Right? And then I put my hand in again. Okay, cool. Right. It's, it's, ooh, it's a little bit hot. Okay. So open up the cold tap a little more. Stick your hand in again. Okay, now it's perfect. But now there isn't enough water pressure. Okay, so we open up the hot tap some more. It's too hot. Open up the cold tap some more. It's too cold. Hot tap some more. Okay, it's perfect. Then we hop in, right? We have successfully made a shower that is suitable to our bodies. And the next morning, you can come to the same shower at the same time of day, and that process is going to be slightly different, right? You're not going to know exactly how far you turned the, the first time, and you know it's going to be a little bit different. And when you go traveling the world, you know you stay at the Pratia Parktonian Hotel, Bravantin, you um, it's going to be different, right? It's going to be a whole other shebang. Um, and so that feels a lot more like what software feels like, because you're kind of going through a cycle here, and the cycle that you go through is. You do something, you stick your hand in the water, and you feel whether you're doing the right thing or not, and then you change something and you feel again. Yeah? Does that sound a little bit more familiar? So the cycle that you're going through there is build, measure, learn. Yeah? So you're going to arrive there, you're going to build something, you're going to check to see whether it feels right, and you're going to learn something about how you're doing it differently. Right? And the same thing applies to design. So when you're designing code, right? You've got certain code in certain places, right? That's what design's all about. And you're going to feel like, oh, it's a bit hard to change this. And then you're going to see, okay, cool, well, maybe if we put these certain things in different kinds of places, uh, it's going to be a little bit easier, right? So we're going to, in going through that process, we're going to learn what good design looks like for us and what bad design looks like for us. Okay, so let's talk about this word emerge. So I like the word emerge because it means become apparent, yeah? So what's interesting about this is a picture Sherlock Holmes, right? Our next metaphor, Captain Detective with his pipe, right? And he walks around the room where the murder has happened. Mm -hmm. And he says, aha, I have noticed all these clues and it has become apparent to me that this guy is the murderer. Yeah? And so good design, emergent design, is the same kind of thing. It's this process of seeing what's happening around you and then at some point it becomes apparent to you what the right way is of designing something. And the key difference here between emergent design and upfront design 
is that in emergent design, you get the chance to see it when you're actually there, right? Because when you're guessing three months ago, you don't actually know, right? So you're actually getting to see what good design is when you're in the thick of things, right? You actually have a really good touch with reality. Um, what emergent design is not, and this is what some people think, is it does not mean become well designed. Yeah, there's no such thing as something magically being well designed. Um, and this is a really important thing to think about because we still have to do design if we're doing emergent design. We, in fact, we have to do design all the time because nothing is going to magically become well designed. We're going to notice while we're coding what the correct design is, but we're going to have to do some work to make that design come about. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, so if we don't know what the right design is up front, then what happens? And so there used to be this thing that people talked about which was called the change curve. Um, and that basically, this was like a law, right? And this is one of the reasons why big upfront design was so popular, right? Why this was an important notion. And it says that a change made in analysis for $1 would cost thousands to fix in production, yeah? So if an analyst had thought, hmm, maybe that doesn't make sense and changed it, you know, six months ago, then you never would have spent two weeks designing it, and we never would have spent three weeks developing it, and we never would have spent four weeks testing it, and we never would have spent two weeks integrating it, and another three weeks integrating it again, and then testing it again, and then putting it in production, and then realizing it was the wrong thing, right? And then having to fix it and go through all those loops again. Yeah? That is expensive, right? That analyst better get the right thing right the first time. Um, but we say no to that. And the way that we do that is through what we call agile engineering practices, right? Or XP practices. So we do things like continuous integration, and we do self-testing code, and we have automated deployments, and we have automated infrastructure provisioning, and we have fast feedback, and we have pair programming. And all of these things are about building quality into the process of writing software, so that software is easy to change, right? So that it's cheaper to make decisions later on, yeah? Because emergent design, by definition, means that you're only going to make a decision about the design of something while you're busy coding it. And so, in order to be able to do that, that code needs to be changeable. Uh, and so if you're not doing all of these engineering practices that go along with emergent design, emergent design just isn't possible. Because right? you're not going to be able to, to change anything. And then you're basically going to be stuck. Because you're going to have a not very designed system, and you wouldn't be able to change it. Because right? you don't have that safety net. All right, so I'm not going to spend too much time today talking about what good design is. I'm just going to spend a little bit of time on it. So a good design, in essence, this is our heading, is about simplicity. You ever guys ever felt like that? Yeah? You sat down to write a feature that seems pretty damn simple, and then you go, oh. right, why is this so hard? Right, this is so much harder than I thought it should be. And this moment over here is a really important design moment. It's the moment that you realize that something is poorly designed. Yeah? And you should trust your instinct here because this is that instinct of noticing when something is harder than you think it should be is your kind of catalyst for mm, something needs to change. Yeah? And so simplicity is very important because so Richard Hughes is the guy who wrote Closure and he says a system made out of genuinely simple parts is going to be able to affect the greatest change with the least work. Yeah? So if we go back to that example that I had right at the beginning of the talk, if we had made things simple to change the first time around then maybe we would have been able to add that, that next feature a bit more easily. Yeah, does that make sense? Cool. So I'm going to steal from Kent a little bit here and say that there are four elements of simple design. Yeah, so this is the last slide that we have on like what good design actually is. Um, and the first one there is passes the test, which is not actually a design thing at all, right? It's does this code do what it's meant to do? And then we make sure that we reveal intention. So is it clear to us what this is meant to do, right? Is the wire blue, right? Mm, yes, blue, this is what this wire is for, right? Is there no duplication, right? Are we cutting out unnecessary extras, right? So that if I come and change something, I have to change it in 10 places instead of one, that's not great, so we're trying to try and reduce duplication. And also we want the fewest number of elements that get the job done, and that's important too. All right, so I hope hopefully convinced you that it's important to design code. I have hopefully convinced you that emergent design is a sensible way of just designing code because you kind of you know everything that you need to know when you're making the decisions, and we've kind of we change the changed curves so we we have the ability to change things. Now let's talk about when you actually design, right? How do we do design? 
And so I argue that there are two different places, two different kinds, two different modes of design. And the first one is away from the code. Um, and it's really, really important that we do this one. Um, it's important to talk about design. Um, so that example that I had at the beginning was very simple, right? It was me and the product owner, and we coded, I coded something for the product owner. But that's not really the thing, right? So how many people here work in teams? Yeah? Pretty much all of us. So if you work in a team, it's important to talk about design, right? Because that's how you're going to figure out what works, because you, you kind of you know, navigate this code together. And so if you're talking about it all the time, you're going to get a sense of what you think is good design, what someone else thinks is good design, and how those things fit together. You can actually talk about the things that are difficult to design, because sometimes design is hard. It can be really useful to draw something, right? So sometimes you see devs at whiteboards and writing on pieces of paper, and because it's sometimes useful to talk in abstract terms about the system that you're working with, right? And talk about what the potentially movable pieces might be. And actually, a, a pretty good test of whether or not a system is well designed is, can someone who works on that code base draw up the basic design pretty quickly out of from memory, right? Like, do they understand the main kind of pieces are without looking at some big document. Another thing that's really important is that you should know what your challenges are. So on my team we have uh, what we call our tech debt wall. Right? So it's basically a bunch of design issues that we have with our code base. And we kind of plot them out on like how hard it would be to fix it and how valuable it would be for us to fix it. And we talk about it. And we say, okay, cool, well maybe this is the next thing that we should tackle and maybe that's the thing after that that we need to tackle. And we kind of talk about what are the things that are difficult when we're trying to write new features. It's also important in doing that to understand where we're going, right? Like, do we have some sort of direction in mind? If we understand what our problems are, do we know how we want to fix that? What is the right way of doing design for this particular element of our system? And so that's a really important thing as well. So I'll tell you a story about our team recently. Um, we started tracking custom metrics. Uh, so this one isn't really a design concern, I guess, but it's the number of feature toggles that we had in our system that were old. Um, but you can very easily track other metrics like this, right? Like how many classes have more than 500 lines or, you know, um, some other sort of design metric that's important to you. And what we did is we put that up on our screen and we said, okay, cool, well, we've got 10 of them. And over time, we tracked kind of, because we knew as a team, like we had the direction, like we wanted to get rid of them all. And so we you know, just slowly, as people worked on stuff, they removed them. And you can see it here on one day, someone went, ah, there's only five left or whatever. Screw it, I'm gonna take the 10 minutes and delete them all, yeah? And this can be a really useful way of going through this. The next thing that I want to talk about is coding and designing at the same time. And this is an important thing. So in order to do that, I need to talk about refactoring. And refactoring is basically a change that you make to the internal structure of software to make it easier and cheaper to change um, without changing its observable behavior. So people reuse the term refactoring and misuse the term refactoring a lot, but this is what I mean when I say refactoring. It's like a series of small changes that you make to a system to improve the design without actually changing what you do. And there are three times that you do it. First of all, you do it before you start coding, right? So we call this preparatory refactoring. So Ken says, make the change easy. Warning, this may be hard. Then make the easy change, right? And it's really about sitting down in front of the code, having that moment of, wow, why is this so hard? And then shaping the system to accommodate your change. Yeah, and that's a really important process to go through when you pick up some new code. Um, it's also important that you kill all your darlings, right? So just because you wrote the most beautifully designed class and method the day before, sorry, if it needs to go, it needs to go, yeah? The next kind of design that you're going to be doing while you're coding is what we call continuous refactoring, right? And that's what you do during your time of coding, right? Like I'm actually working on the feature now. And this is the, the TDD cycle, right? Red, green, refactor. And we always forget about that last step, right? Write a failing test. Pass and on to the next failing. No, wait, hang on, right? Take a step back and see whether the change that you've just made actually makes sense. And is it going to be easy for the next person to understand? And so it's really important not to forget that last step and to do that small piece of refactoring, right? The more frequently you do refactoring, the more frequently you take those small steps, right? The better design your system is going to be. And make sure that you talk through it even as you code, right? So even if you don't do pair programming in your environment, pull someone aside, right? And say, I'm busy doing this, what do you think? The last kind of design that you do while you're coding is afterwards, right? And you take a step back from doing that, right? So Martin puts this really well. He says, when writing code, we should always be thinking of the reader, right? And this is very true, right? At university, you learn how to be really clever about coding. And then when you get to workplace, it's kind of about learning how to not be so clever so that the next person who picks up your code can actually understand what's going on. And you should always remember that. 
And the bug says, always leave the campground cleaner than you found it, right? Any small improvements that you can make that make someone's life easier the next time around, that's really valuable. And it's an interesting balancing act between the preparatory refactoring and this refactoring that you do afterwards, right? Because you don't want to do too much, right? You want to make it easier for the next person, but you have to realize that perfect is the enemy of good enough, right? You can spend a lot of time making something well designed, but it's really, really, it's a bit of a skill, right? Like you need to know when the right time is to stop. It's going to be easy for someone to pick up next time, but I'm not going to break my head over the fact that this thing isn't perfect. Cool. Really, really quick recap. Working code is not enough. Make sure that you go through this build, measure, learn cycle. That's emergent design. And we do that by changing the change code, right? Making it easier for ourselves to make change. Good design is all about simplicity. You're going to design code away from the code and in front of the code. There are some resources, and my slides will be up after this. Thank you. <laughs>